Good afternoon. Last semester I decided that it would be better for me to post videos instead of trying to respond to each one of your discussion um, threads and I think it worked out really well. I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback on uh, my videos this semester. I know that I'm a bit awkward <laughs> but I'm trying to um, do this without seeming that way. Can you tell that way? Can you tell? Um, so let me start talking um, about a little housekeeping thing, a few housekeeping matters. Um, first, um, it's hard to believe that we've started week three of this course already, which means you're basically halfway through your class. Um, everyone's off to a great start. It looks like everyone knows um, what's going on and what's expected. This is actually the first semester I've had um, few comments or questions about things so once we got the dates on the syllabus fixed it seems like everyone knows exactly what's going on so that's really good but um, anytime you have questions feel free to reach out to me I know that um, it's difficult sometimes to interpret directions and expectations in an online class um, I want to clarify that um, the behavior support plan is due on June July 12th and the differentiated unit plan is due on July 28th and the final will actually be on August 2nd. It is a multiple choice final with 50 questions and you'll have plenty of time to take it and you can use your notes. Um, everyone, it seems that everyone has partners. If you don't have a partner for the behavior support plan and the differentiated unit plan, please let me know and I'll reach out again and see if I can help you. But it looks like everyone has partners. Um, it also looks like everyone signed up for the technology project. Be sure and check the modules for the assignments. There's um, a module for each assignment that has rubrics and further instructions um, to make sure you know exactly what I expect, um, which will help with your grade, of course. It's super important that you read all of that information and the information in the syllabus. Um, so week one, the week one discussion was about um, pretty much about your perceptions of inclusive teaching and um, uh, there were some videos and to help you understand where other people are coming from. Before I go much further, I wanna to talk to you about my perspective of inclusive teaching. Uh, you should know that my area of expertise is students with emotional and behavioral disorders, so um, inclusion with the students that I work with looks somewhat different than with other students, so um, it's important that you think about that when I talk about inclusive teaching. Um, so we know that there's literature that suggests that inclusive teaching is beneficial to students with and without learning disabilities, meaning that the typical developing peers actually benefit from being around or working with students with learning disabilities. This is not true for all categories. Um, not that it's not effective, but the research just hasn't been done. There's difficulties with doing research around inclusion. Uh, for one thing, no one really agrees on what inclusion means. And you guys posted some of that in your discussions. Um, so what is full inclusion? Is it in students with disabilities in an inclusive setting with a special ed teacher, without a special ed teacher, um, with a special ed teacher that pushes in sometimes, with an aide sometimes? There's so many different models that are going on um, that it's really difficult to do research around that. Um, I've seen inclusive teaching really work and I've seen inclusive teaching not work. So it depends on the teachers, it depends on the student, it depends on the environment. Um, I think it's really important to understand um, the tenet of least restrictive environment in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. Least restrictive environment is where the student's IEP can best be implemented. So when we go into IEP meetings, we don't, we shouldn't start with the discussion of placement. We should start with the discussion of goals, objectives, benchmarks, and then we should talk about where can those best be taught, best be achieved, um, what's best for the student. And 
super important to think about IEPs, um, the individualized component of the IEPs, which some of you guys mentioned. Um, Mark actually started talking about the IEP. Um, so it's important to remember that the IEP team determines placement based on the IEP and the student's needs and weak, strengths and weaknesses. Um, it was interesting because Zoe talked about um, the woman in the video who had a hearing impairment and the fact that she said that um, she didn't think that students with um, hearing impairment should be placed in general ed settings um, for a number of reasons. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. My nephew um, has a hearing impairment and when he was a senior in high school, he decided that he wanted to be on his home campus. And I really pushed for that because I felt like that was the best placement for him at that time. This was probably eight years ago. Um, but what I found out was that he actually went to a specialized school where they had um, deaf ed counselors who knew how to who knew how to sign and communicate with him. Um, they had um, all the teachers knew how to sign or there was an interpreter. So there was this intense concentration of services in the school where he was actually bused to instead of his neighborhood school, which was actually better for him. It was um, a better setting, even though he wanted to be around his friends, right, in his neighborhood. Um, if you talk to him now, he'll tell you that was probably the best thing that happened. The other thing that it's really important to understand is that um, some people consider themselves part of the deaf community um, and that it's more of a culture than a disability, which makes sense because when you think about cultures being um, often based partially in language, um, it makes sense, right? Because individuals who are deaf tend to communicate through sign language, and so that's their language. Um, you'll notice sometimes you'll see deaf written with a capital D, that refers to the deaf community, a lowercase d actually refers to the hearing impairment. So those are all considerations when you think about what's best and what's not best for inclusion um, or for students in context of inclusion. Margot talked about a magnet school where, um, there where she had observed that had both special and general ed teachers, all of who could sign, which would be really awesome. I would like to observe in that setting. It sounds like a wonderful thing. Um, I suspect that we're, there were also students there who were um, deaf. So more than one student, which could actually help with them forming their own culture, like subculture within um, a school. So that makes sense also. It seems like a really good model. Um, a minute ago when I was talking about the IEP and placement being based on the individual needs of the student, um, Margot had pointed that out also, and um, Hope mentioned that that's precisely what IDEA is about. Um, it's important that you remember that special education is not a place, it's not a classroom. Um, as you can tell, I'm not super young. So when I think about when I was in high school, there was a classroom, um, and I don't even think I was aware of it, where students with disabilities were taught in this completely self-contained setting. Um, also, make sure the video is still running. Um, so you have to think about where we've come from that point. Things are much better. And um, we know that students with disabilities have to be educated with students without disabilities to the greatest extent appropriate for that student. Um, Stacy mentioned that she thought it was interesting that New Jersey um, ranked lowest in inclusion. Um, that doesn't surprise me. When I first moved to New Jersey from Texas, I was completely surprised at the number of students who were in out of school placements um, in Texas. Probably um, based on some of the things that have gone on in Texas, this is probably not a good comparison. But um, we didn't place students out of district unless it was like the last resort. It rarely happened. Um, it seems like in New Jersey, there's a lot of special ed. There's a lot of specialized schools for students with certain disabilities. Um, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it kind of goes against the idea of inclusion. Um, I have worked with a couple of districts that are moving towards a more inclusive setting or a more inclusive model, 
it's not easy, right? So hopefully this class will help you guys learn um, some strategies and knowledge and skills to help you actually be successful inclusive inclusive teaching. Um, Stacy talked about teachers who would about dual certification and the fact that some teachers don't want to teach special ed. Um, way back when, when we first started talking about inclusion, that was a big deal. I had lots of general ed teachers that would say to me, you know, if I wanted to teach special ed, I would have gone back to school to get a, um, a, a license in teaching special ed, but I don't. I want to teach AP English. So it's interesting the way things have evolved and all of a sudden we have general ed teachers who probably didn't intend to teach special education with special ed students in their classroom. Typically, they do have either an assistant with them or a special ed teacher, which is what we would want to see, right? Um, maybe not necessarily with the student, but co-teaching the classroom. Dinah mentioned funding. Funding is an issue with special ed. Um, although districts don't have a lot of funding, it's important to remember that when you're in an IEP meeting, you can't say, um, I can't provide, the district can't provide that service because we don't have the money. That's actually not okay because um, the spirit of the law is that we provide services to students that they need. Federal ed, um, special education is actually funded through IDEIA. However, the law has never been completely funded. So it's almost like a circular um, issue. It's, it's quite a conundrum. So that's the issue with funding. It's really important though that you never say we don't have funding for that or we don't have that placement because the idea is that you can create that placement, right? If that's what the student needs. Um, so I don't know that I ever got around to telling you my perspective on, on inclusion. My perspective on inclusion is kind of summing up what we just, what I just talked about. Um, inclusion works and it's important for some students, but not all. I'm very much married to the idea of least restrictive environment and placing a student in the setting where his IEP can be addressed and where um, he can receive specialized services. Obviously, um, that's a component of special education, which is near and dear to my heart. If a student needs one-on-one -on -one instruction, then they should not necessarily be in a general ed setting. If a student's not prepared, doesn't have the skills to function um, socially in a general ed setting, then we should um, not place them there, but we should start teaching those skills so that they can be prepared. Um, one thing you'll learn in this class is about transitioning from self-contained classes to um, general ed classes, and that's super important to think about what does it take to transition a child? What skills do they need? What skills as special educators should we teach prior to sending them into um, a general ed classroom? So let's talk about week two discussion. Uh, week two was all about um, traditions, customs, um, working with multi in multicultural settings, understanding um, equity for students with disabilities. Um, from different minority groups or even different disabilities. Um, there was a video that talked about, oh, it was the Solomon video, where they talked about parents looking for a cure um, as if this was a horrible thing um, versus culture. So kind of we could go back to the deaf ed community that we were talking about a minute ago. Um, when a child's born who is um, deaf or hearing impaired, you would expect a parent to be sad at first, right? To some degree until they got used to it. Um, and that's true with all disabilities. Um, it's about learning. It's about parents teaching themselves um, what they need to know to understand what it's like to have a child with a disability and what they can do, right? Um, so do we, do parents want to cure their children? Probably not. Um, by the time the kid's old enough for them to realize that the disability is part of their child and it's kind of part of their identity. But it takes a while to get to that process. And as teachers, we need to understand the process. The process of parents understanding. Um, there's a lot of denial that I've worked. I've worked with parents who are in denial and that's okay. Um, it's just our job to start where the parent is and move forward. 
when we work with children from other cultures, it's super important to um, understand their cultures, their customs, their beliefs. Um, and the way we do that is by talking to the students. We talk to the parents. We understand where they're coming from. Um, so I think you read a lot of that and you understood um, where you were coming from. We actually had two parents of children with disabilities that um, contributed. Um, Jennifer pointed, oh wait, 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 not Jennifer. Um, uh, oh, Chris, Kristen responded to Mark and said, when my son was diagnosed with autism, it was very hard to accept this, which is what you would expect, right? Luckily, I had a support group of, wonder, group of wonderful yeah, people yeah, around yeah. me. One colleague gave me this poem, which always helps me understand my journey. And it is a journey. It's a journey regardless of whether your child has a disability or not. Um, I have to say, I was super impressed that yeah. um, Mark stated that he enjoyed yeah. reading the textbook. Uh, I guess you hear April has joined us. April is my daughter Emma's dog, and Emma happens to be in Texas. So mm -hmm. April would like um, my attention. <laughs> she can't have it right now. Um, but she's going to come over here and sit beside me. Um, what else? Um, I, oh, the other thing that was really interesting was when Hope wrote about standing up for yourself and teaching students what that means. When I taught adaptive behavior in a middle school in a small town in Texas, my students thought they stood up for themselves. <laughs> that pretty much meant that they punched someone in the face or um, all kinds of other things that were inappropriate. Um, it's also interesting for me to think about growing up um, as a young child in Texas. I was frequently taught to stand, told to stand up for myself, um, which also meant pretty much go out there and stand up for yourself important and that still causes me problems at times so I think it's important that we teach that social skill what does it mean to stand up for yourself um, yeah what does that mean how do you teach that so I think that's an important concept for you guys to think about um, I'm, I'm gonna end this discussion with um, what Mark said when he said school is the first lines where those horizontal identities are crafted created and altered it's therefore our role as educators to ensure that students are provided with a supportive environment where these other identities have the chance to become informed and molded into an identity by the student without the bullying of peers or the judgment of others. That is so important when we talk about diversity. School's a safe place. We make it a safe place for students to really come to understand themselves. And finally, I wanna to talk to you about the technology projects. You guys did a great job. Um, Margo talked about Microsoft Edge and some of the plugins that go with that um, to be used with Windows 10. I thought that was super exciting. When we think about specialized services that we used to have to make arrangements for and now they're right there at, at students' fingertips. Um, Didi presented Class Dojo, which um, I would have loved to have had when I was teaching. I love Class Dojo. And um, I thought I would point out that I'm working with a teacher now who's in an adaptive behavior classroom with some pretty um, students with some pretty severe behaviors. And um, what she's done is made a token board with the little class dojo um, logo. And so students earn points towards a class dojo point. And it's really working well because they're all about seeing those class dojos and communicating that with parents, which is an evidence-based intervention, right? Um, that pretty much sums it up for these two weeks. If you have questions or um, comments, please feel free to leave those in the discussion board where I'm gonna place the video. Um, and it was nice talking to you. I suspect April's gonna tell you goodbye too.